It's midnight and you're tuning in to Nightline with me, Muhammad Ahmad Hamdan. The top stories. Prime Minister urges Malaysians to treat differences as source of strength. And MA63 Council agrees on amendment to restore Sabah and Sarawak as equal partners. Our headlining story, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob has called on Malaysians to treat differences as an advantage rather than a weakness and similarities as a source of strength in dealing with the current twin crisis of economy and health. The Prime Minister said as a Malaysian family, everyone needs to work together to revive the country and adapt to new norms. Jangan kerana kita berbeza pendapat, berlainan wadah atau cara pendekatan menyebabkan hilang nilai ukhuwah dan semangat perpaduan yang sekian lama terjamin. Apa jua perbezaan, kita jadikan sebagai kelebihan dan bukannya kelemahan. Manakala sebarang persamaan, kita jadikan sebagai sumber kekuatan. Datuk Sri Ismail said this in a special message in conjunction with the Maulidu Rasul celebration on Tuesday. Based on the belief that Prophet Muhammad wasallam is the best role model for mankind, including when he became the head of state in building Madinah, the Prime Minister said the government would continue to emulate the initiatives implemented by the Prophet as a guide in the country's administration for the prosperity of the Malaysian family. Siapapun kita, sama ada seorang bapa, Ibu, anak, jiran, pekerja, ketua pejabat, pemimpin masyarakat, pemimpin agama atau pemimpin politik. Masing-masing perlu memainkan peranan untuk memulihkan kembali negara ini demi kesejahteraan keluarga Malaysia. In the context of humanity, Datuk Sri Ismail said Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a model in upholding the brotherhood of humanity when he sought to eliminate any form of discrimination based on religion, race, skin color or descent. This shows that Islam is a religion that is built on the principle of takrim al-insan or honoring of humanity and is also in line with the federal constitution including article 12 which accords the right to education to all citizens without any discrimination on the basis of their religion, race, descent, gender or place of birth. On the theme of this year's Maulidu Rasul celebration, which is Manhaj Rabbani Ummah Berkualiti, Dr. Sri Ismail said it led to the norms of life that emphasize the principles of the Manhaj Rabbani policy, namely blessings, peace, godliness, devotion and justice, which are in line with the three main thrusts of the Malaysian family concept, namely inclusivity, common ground and contentment. Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Religious Affairs, Idris Ahmad, meanwhile called on all agencies responsible for Islamic affairs to work hand-in-hand hand with the society. This, he said, was especially crucial in helping to revive the country which has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Food Bank, Robok Rezeki, Scott, Scott Jajak Asnaf adalah antara program yang sedia terlaksana di wilayah persekutuan. He said this beneficiating the federal territories level Maulidu Rasul 2021 celebration in Kuala Lumpur on Tuesday. Idris also expressed hope that in the context of the federal territories, that the Federal Territories Islamic Religious Council, together with Jawi, will continue to double their efforts in empowering Muslims in the aspects of education, socio-economy, welfare and the unity of the Ummah. At the same function, Idris also called for a local alcoholic beverage company to immediately change its Timah brand and the picture used on the bottle. He said such things should not happen as they are provocative, while the use of the name could cause confusion to the community and religion. Saya amat bersetuju lah, sepatutnya benda yang bersifat provokasi ini jangan untuk lah. Jangan nama-nama yang menimbulkan kekeliruan. Arak itu tetap haram, kita tetap atas nama apa pun. 
Dan nama-nama tu tak boleh lah kita nak letak nama tu. Apa, apa, apa maksud dia letak nama tu? Adakah untuk wujud normalisasi baru? Ha, ini kita bimbang. On Monday, Pulau Pinang Mufti Datuk Sri Wan Salim Wan Muhammad Noor in a statement expressed disappointment over an advertisement that had gone viral on social media which stated that a locally made whiskey had been given the brand name Tima and displayed a bearded man with a skull cap or kopia resembling a religious man. In addition, Idris stressed that he will further discuss the matter with the Home Ministry as well as the Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs Ministry. Meanwhile, Public Services Commission committee member Tan Sri Othman Mustafa was named the recipient of the Federal Territories Level Top Maulidu Rasul Figure Award this year. The Federal Territories Islamic Religious Department, or JAWI, in a statement said the decision made by the Maulidu Rasul Figure Award Selection Committee was based on his excellent contribution towards the development of Ummah and Islamic teachings. In his speech, delivered via a pre-recorded video, Tansri Othman described the award as a form of trust and responsibility to the religion and the country in ensuring that the Islamic teachings continue to be propagated. The former Malaysian Islamic Development Department, or JAKIM, Director General said he would continue to contribute his expertise and knowledge to develop the Muslim community, especially in the federal territories, to be competitive, progressive, dynamic and united based on the teachings of Ahli Sunnah Wal Jama'ah. The Special Council on Malaysia Agreement 1963 MKMA 63 has agreed to propose amendments to the federal constitution that would essentially put Sabah and Sarawak on equal status footing as West Malaysia in the Federation. Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Sabah and Sarawak Affairs, Dato Sri Maximus Onkili, said the amendments would redefine the meaning of federation, adding that it is expected to be tabled during the next parliament sitting. Datuk Sri Maximus said the decision to amend Article 1, Bracket 2 and Article 160, Bracket 2 of the Constitution was made during the nearly three-hour MKMA 63 meeting chaired by Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob on Monday. The proposal was tabled by Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Law and Parliament, Datuk Sri Wan Junaidi Tuan Jafar, who also heads the Council's Equal Status Working Committee. Datuk Sri Maximus, in quoting Datuk Sri Wan Junaidi in a statement on Tuesday, said the current proposed amendment is different from the one proposed by the Pakatan Harapan government in 2018, as the amendment would define the status of all states in Malaysia in line with the Federation of Malaya Agreement 1957, MA63, and the position following Singapore's exit in 1965. He also said the MKMA 63 also agreed on empowering both the Sabah and Sarawak governments to issue licenses for deep sea fishing. During the meeting, Agriculture and Food Industries Minister Dato Sri Ronald Kiandi tabled a paper to seek approval from the council to empower the fisheries department in Sabah to issue licenses for vessels and fishing equipment for zone C fishing spots, which is currently handled by the department on the federal level. He also said that they will continue to look at outstanding issues related to the rights of the Bornean states. Human Resources Minister Dr. Sri M. Saravanan has clarified that the government has not banned Malaysians from applying for visas to work on farms in Australia. In a statement on Tuesday, Dr. Sri Saravanan said Putrajaya did not bar any Malaysian intending to go abroad for employment, subject to the terms, conditions and laws of the relevant country. He said there has been confusion on the matter recently after his deputy, Dr Awang Hashim, responded to a question on Australia's farming sector workers scheme in the Dewan Negara last week. This scheme, according to Dr Sri Saravanan, was introduced to address the shortage of workers in the farming sector in Australia, an issue that the Malaysian agricultural industry was facing as well. Dr Sri Saravanan, who was briefed on the scheme by Australian High Commissioner Justin Lee last month, said Malaysia would not be emulating the visa program for migrants here as it leads to an offer of permanent citizenship. He said therefore this matter is not related in any way to barring Malaysians from working abroad, including in Australia. Australia's farm visa scheme allows Australian employers to sponsor skilled, semi-skilled and unskilled workers from the region to work on their farms. Workers are allowed to work there for three years, after which they could apply to become a permanent resident of Australia. 
Dato Awang had said Putrajaya was not planning to adopt Australia's approach in boosting the workforce in the agricultural sector as it was focusing on hiring locals to enter the industry. Moving on, ASEAN travel corridors are considered as one of the ways to ensure economic recovery for nations affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. This was stated during a meeting of the Committee of Permanent Representatives of ASEAN on Tuesday morning in the presence of the Foreign Affairs Minister, Dr. Saifuddin Abdullah, at the ASEAN Secretariat Headquarters in Jakarta, Indonesia. Boleh kata semua uh, wakil-wakil tetap uh, bercerita tentang kepentingan membuka uh, semula sempadan uh, negara-negara ASEAN sebagai satu cara memulihkan ekonomi ASEAN. Datuk Saifuddin also said all permanent representatives to ASEAN have also agreed to synchronize efforts to open borders among ASEAN countries. He further said that the digital economy should be a sector that has an important role in efforts to increase post-pandemic economic growth. In the meeting with the ASEAN Secretary General, Dato Saifuddin also discussed the effort to strengthen the ASEAN countries and their role for the future. He added that understanding of ASEAN also needs to be improved, especially for the youth. Dato Saifuddin's visit on Tuesday was welcomed by ASEAN Secretary General Dato Paduka Lim Jok Hoi and Malaysia's permanent representative to ASEAN, Kamsa Kamarudin. On Monday, Datuk Saifuddin had a brief meeting with the President of Indonesia, Joko Widodo, at the State Palace in Jakarta. In the meeting, he shared about preparations for Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob's first visit to Jakarta, slated for mid-November. Amno President Datuk Sri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi has alluded to the fact that he is not closing the door completely on his party's political cooperation with PAS under Muafakat National. In fact, the Bagandatu lawmakers at AMNO and Barisan National BN are undecided on official political alliances as the Malacca election looms. In a media conference in conjunction with the launch of AMNO state election machinery, Dr. Sri Ahmad Zahid said its official decision will be announced after AMNO and BN Supreme Council members have met. He said that a political bureau meeting, AMNO Supreme Council meeting, followed by the BN Supreme Council meeting, are all slated to be held next week. The former Deputy Prime Minister also admitted that he has been approached by other parties to form political packs ahead of the state election. Pelbagai pihak datang kepada kami, kami berlapang dada dan berfikiran terbuka siapa sahaja yang mahu memberikan pandangan, kami terima. Namun segala keputusan akan kita putuskan secara kolektif apabila tiba masa dia. He added that his party is putting emphasis on science and data via statistics obtained from the 2013 and 2018 general elections when fielding candidates. The election commission on Monday set November 20th as polling day for the Malacca state election and November 8th for nomination, giving parties 12 days to campaign. In the meantime, independent lawmaker Datuk Norhizam Hassan Bakti will not have a place in any of the Pakatan Harapan or PH component parties in the upcoming Malacca state election. DAP Secretary General Lim Guan Eng said they were adamant in rejecting the party's former Pengkalan Batu State Assemblyman as a candidate to represent the opposition coalition in the polls. Bayar tak timbul lagi. Uh, ini dijadikan sebagai satu keputusan tegas. Kita tak terima. Dia sebagai calon dalam pihak raya negeri. Lim added that the matter will be brought up in the PH Presidential Council discussion. He said this after a meeting with the Malacca DAP leadership on Tuesday. Lim, however, declined to comment further on the reason behind DAP's stand. In the 14th general election, Datuk Norhizam won the Pakalan Batu seat on a DAP ticket but became an independent lawmaker and backed AMNO and Perikatan National leading to the formation of a new state government last March. However, Lim did not comment on the position of three other former state assemblymen who, together with Datuk Norhizam, withdrew their support for Chief Minister Datuk Sri Sulaiman Mat Ali, causing the state government to collapse. Apart from Datuk Norhizam, the three others who withdrew support for Datuk Sri Sulaiman are Datuk Sri Idris Harun and Datuk Nur Azman Hassan of BN and Datuk Nora Fandi Ahmad from Bersatu. The three have since been sacked by their respective parties for their actions. 
After this breather, police call in drivers for their statements over viral video. Welcome back. Dato Sri Amiruddin Shari has come out to deny allegations of him being on the take from illegal gambling syndicates to allow them to continue operating within the state. He tweeted his denial following allegations that arose from a particular Twitter handle, Edisi Siasat MY, that alleged that Selangor Menteri Besar had received upwards of 150,000 ringgit from such illegal syndicates. Datus Riyami Rudin stated that the allegations linking him with receiving monthly payments from illegal gambling syndicates as absolutely baseless. The allegations by the Twitter handle Edisi Siasat MY claim these gambling syndicates are only able to continue operating by paying off the police, the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission MACC, local government officers and even PKR and DAP politicians. It alleged that local government officers were receiving between 10,000 and 20,000 ringgit a month from these syndicates, and how Dato Sri Amiruddin had used the illicit funds to finance his political career. The EDC Siasad MY Twitter account has over the last month posted allegations mostly about the country's top officials and politicians and their apparent corrupt ways. Those named and implicated in a series of tweets include MACC Chief Commissioner Dato Sri Azambaki, Inspector General of Police Dato Sri Akril Sani, several businessmen and politicians such as Dato Sri Amiruddin. Our Sabah Police is focusing on improving more modern logistics assets and technical equipment in an effort to strengthen security control in the state's waters and borders. Its commissioner, Dr Idris Abdullah, said the improvement was to ensure continuous operations to tackle cross-border criminal activities. Kita tahu di Sabah ni kita mempunyai persepadan yang cukup luas. Ya, cukup luas. Kita memerlukan satu aset-aset yang cukup berkesan ya, dalam kita untuk mengawal di sekitar airan kita ini tadi. Ya, jadi uh, di samping itu juga kita memerlukan juga di segi peralatan-peralatan teknikal. Although the situation is now under control, ongoing operations are being carried out to address the threat of kidnappings, the entry of illegal immigrants and the threat of militant groups. Dato Idris said that the police are stepping up cooperation with various agencies, including the Sabah East Coast Special Security Area, or ESCOM, in the Eastern Sabah Security Zone, or S-Zone. He also added that the cooperation was also done with the Indonesian and Philippine security forces. It is also understood that priority is also given to the intelligence aspect, including the assistance of every citizen as the eyes and ears of the authorities against any criminal activity. 
Police have called in two motorists for questioning after a video of a traffic incident in Bandar Sri Damansara went viral. A dash cam footage shows a multi-purpose vehicle MPV slamming its brakes in front of a car while passing through a traffic light junction while it was green, almost causing a collision in the process. But Haling Jaya OCPD Assistant Commissioner Muhammad Fakhruddin Abdul Hamid said the District Traffic Investigation and Enforcement Department detected the video at 10.28 p.m. on Sunday. He said police have traced the drivers of both vehicles involved and one of them has already come forward to give a statement. The driver of the other vehicle, meanwhile, is expected to be coming forward soon. He said inve uh, initial investigations revealed that the incident occurred at 11.44 a.m. on October 11th, adding that no accident or injury was involved. <laughs> Coming up, Polish Prime Minister accuses the EU of blackmail as row escalates. Staying with us, Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki accused the EU of blackmail on Tuesday in a public clash with European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen over his country's rejection of parts of EU law. Von der Leyen, speaking just before Morawiecki took the podium, warned that would act to rein Poland in. This was his response. <laughs> Niedopuszczalne jest narzucanie innym swojej decyzji bez podstawy prawnej. Tym bardziej niedopuszczalne jest używanie do tego celu języka szantażu finansowego, mówienie o karach czy używanie jeszcze dalej idących słów wobec niektórych państw członkowskich. Odrzucam język gruźb, pogróżek i wymuszeń. Nie zgadzam się na to, by politycy szantażowali i straszyli Polskę. He also said that the bloc's top court was conducting a silent revolution with its rulings, which, which go against democratic standards. The clash in the European Parliament follows a top Polish court ruling that rejected the core principle that EU law has primacy over national legislation. The case brought by the Polish Prime Minister was the first time that an EU member state's leader had questioned EU treaties in a national constitutional court. Campaigning for Japan's general election began Tuesday with new Prime Minister Fumio Kishida seeking a mandate for his COVID-19 and economic policies while opposition parties are banding together in a bid to counter the ruling coalition's grip on power. Over 1,051 candidates are vying for 465 seats in the October 31st lower house election with Kishida's Liberal Democratic Party LDP and smaller partner Komieto looking to retain their overall majority. Kishida, who took office on October 4th, has pledged to realize economic growth and redistribute wealth to the middle class in a course correction of Abenomics, which has been criticized as helping lift corporate earnings and share prices 
but failing to spark wage gains. The bloc faces a test from the main opposition constitutional Democratic Party, CDP, which is largely putting up a unified front with a smaller Japanese Communist Party, JCP, and two other groups. North Korea fired a ballistic missile into the sea on Tuesday, its latest in a series of tests, with analysts saying it could have been a submarine launch weapon. South Korea's defense ministry said the missile was fired from Sinpo into the sea east of the peninsula. Sinpo, where the missile was fired from, is a major naval shipyard and satellite photographs have previously shown submarines at the facility. The North is known to be developing a submarine-launched ballistic missile and previously carried out an underwater launch. Following Tuesday's test, the South Presidential Office said it was convening a meeting of the National Security Council and that South Korean and the U.S. intelligence are closely analyzing it. Meanwhile, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said Japan is investigating the latest missile launch. The U.S. military condemned the act and called on the country to refrain from any further destabilizing acts. Greece hands over Winter Olympic flame to Beijing amidst protests. Stay tuned. Sport, the 2022 Winter Olympics. Greece on Tuesday handed over the Olympic flame to organizers of the 2022 Beijing Winter Games, a day after the lighting ceremony was disrupted by activists calling for the event to be postponed, arguing that China was perpetrating genocide against Uyghurs and Tibetans. Hellenic Olympic Committee Chief Spiros Kapralos gave the Olympic torch to Vice President of the Chinese Olympic Committee Yu Zaiqing at the Panathenaic Stadium in Athens, where the ancient games were revived in 1896. Yu said China vowed to deliver a streamlined, safe and splendid games. The International Olympic Committee has said that the flame will go on display to the public in Beijing before setting off on an exhibition tour. 
Earlier on Monday, actresses dressed as ancient Greek priestesses had earlier lit a cauldron with the Olympic flame after China's Turin 2006 and Vancouver 2010 freestyle ski silver medalist Li Nina ran a lap with a torch in the 2nd century AD stadium. The ceremony was held without spectators, with mainly officials and media in attendance. And that's it for Nightline. Over in the US, the Great Jack O' Lantern Blaze Festival makes its comeback this year, featuring thousands of intricately designed Jack O' Lanterns arranged in large scale displays, all of which have been enhanced and synchronized lighting, uh, enhanced by synchronized lighting and music. Take a look, I'm Mohammed Mohammed, and thank you for watching and stay safe.